Destination Freedom. Destination Freedom, dramatizations of the great democratic traditions of the Negro people, is brought to you by station WMAQ in cooperation with the Chicago Urban League as a part of the pageant of history and of America's own Destination Freedom. Before the beginning of World War I, there was started a mass migration within the United States that was destined to involve two million souls. It was a shift of two million Negro citizens from southern regions to northern cities, and it radically altered the social and economic course of the country. In a chapter entitled, The Birth of a League, Destination Freedom tells the story of the greatest internal migration in American history, and the story of the League which was organized as a result of it. That'll be young Buddy Lane here whistling and kicking up the dust with his brother J.C. Two lanky Negro youths who were hiking it back home to Barrow, Mississippi that year. Guess it was 1909. Oh, maybe eight. Anyway, it was the year the migration started for me, though some say it had been going on all the time. It had been going on heavy even before the Civil War, when old Harriet Tubman ran the Underground Railroad. Maybe it picked up a bit after the Reconstruction when the Ku Klux Klan became the law of the land. But for me and my generation around Burrow, it started just like this. Buddy and J.C. came swinging down the road, their pockets full of the money they'd made working the year in the sawmill at Raymond. They hadn't seen a newspaper or heard a word about what had happened in Burrow in over six months. It was just as well. I didn't have the nerve to tell them. I just looked out at Buddy and waved as he passed my barber shop. Hello, Bud. Hey, well, what do you say, Barber? Hey, look, Jay. <laughs> Here's the old Barber waiting on us. Yeah, get out your sharp scissors, Barber. We've been cheating you long enough. How's our folks? We've been up in there sawmill all winter. I know about that. So what about the folks? How's Mom? She usually writes. I haven't heard a word. That uh, Buddy. Oh, come on, Buddy. Never start a barber to talk, and he'll never stop. Come on, let's just run in and surprise him. Come on. I'm coming. I have that chair ready for me, Barbara. I'm going to want to work when I get back. Come on, Buddy. Come on. Okay, uh, buddy. Buddy. Well, they went off that way down the street towards the colored section of borough where their folks had lived. I couldn't tell them. They had to find out for themselves. I just slumped down in my chair and waited. I knew they'd come back. They had to. The barber. Yes, son. Well, what, um... Oh, where is everybody? Yeah, nobody's home. The place looks like... Like somebody set it on fire. They did. Oh, where's Ma? Where's the folks? Dead, son. You're lying. I wish I were. Oh, for the Lord's sake, what happened, Barbara? They were lynched. Lynched? Oh, oh no, you hold it, buddy. Hold it. Go on, Bob. You must have known about the trouble between your folks and Sheriff Cottoner concerning that farmland near the highway I wanted you all to get off of. You knew how stubborn your old man was. Bob wouldn't back down from what was his for one minute. And there was these mass bandits set in the fire that Cotton, the old man, tried to grow on the farm. Well, after that, they started coming into Burrow, these mass men shooting at the streets and cornered your folks in their house. And your old man had used the last shell from his Winchester. He got him. And they got everybody in the house. Where is that sheriff? Oh, now, now, it's no use going after him, son. You can't do a thing. Well, can't anybody do anything? Can a whole family be murdered before the eyes of everybody in town and there be no law to lift a finger? What happened to the neighbor? There's none of them on the street. Some of them left. Where? Anywhere. Anywhere they could find justice and equality before the law, some say. Those that had money caught the train and went north. No. Those that had money. If you want my advice, your family's still on the clan's list. If you got the fare. We got the fare. You want me to help get the tickets for you and Jay? No. Not yet. And not just for me and Jay. Aren't you leaving? We're leaving. But we're not leaving anyone behind us. Who wants to find a place to live where it can be free from fear and terror and the murder and lynching that 
goes with white supremacy. When we leave, Bob, we're going to take half a burrow with us. Are you ready? <laughs> I wasn't ready, but plenty others were. The Lane brothers worked summer and winter gathering people together, warded off the sheriff's crowd. Then they took them out of town. And that's how the migration started in my place. But it wasn't only in Borough when Negroes were protesting against the white supremacy rule. We could see slowly at first migration starting from Alabama, from Georgia, from Florida, Tennessee, and Texas. At first, the plantation owners just laughed at the ungainly sight, the poor, penniless people taken to the highways with everything they owned on the backs. They laughed at gaunt old Benjamin Singleton of Virginia, whom they referred to as the Moses. And often they'd drive their cars up to his caravan of sharecroppers and call out to him the way one owner did. Hey there, Moses, get a move on you. You and your ragamuffins blocking traffic. <laughs> Uh, my fellows will move the side of the road, sir. You may pass. <laughs> hey, you hear that? Follow as he calls it. <laughs> hey, tell us where you're going, Moses, to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're heading up north with these riffraff, you better get some shoes on your feet and coats on your backs. One blast of that cold Chicago air, and you'll beg me back in the sunny old south. <laughs> Won't they, boys? You bet they will. Hey, you hear that, Moses? Yeah, I hear well, when you go looking for liberty, you don't usually worry about the weather. My folks stood the weather at Valley Forge with George Washington. I see no reason to fear the climate in Chicago. And gaunt and tired Benjamin Singleton would continue with his migrants to Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, and Kansas City. And the exodus grew year by year. Plantation owners were no longer willing to stand aside and watch the migrants leave. And there were investigations of the migrations in the Senate and in the House. And looking over the fields that needed hands and crops that needed harvesting, the Port Gibson Mississippi Reverie demanded... We must pass a law to keep Negroes from leaving the fields at harvest time. Some few short-sighted Southerners, alarmed at the rate Negroes are leaving, are weakening saying we should change our traditional customs, treat them as equals, and persuade them to stay. The only persuasion that's needed is the persuasion of the rope and faggot. Those who encourage this unholy crusade against white supremacy should be dealt with as any other incendiaries outside the law. But there were more cautious voices among the plantation owners who spoke up carefully as in the Macon, Georgia Sun. We disagree with the flamboyant action advocated by some Southerners in this delicate situation. It is true that the Negro has a grievance, and it behooves all planters and civic leaders to organize a convention of both white and Negro citizens to meet in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and discuss means of regulating this unfortunate migration. The Vicksburg Convention went into session. Planters and farm owners and landlords rose and spoke glowingly of the need for Negroes remaining in the South. And near the end of the speech making by the planters, a gaunt old man asked for the floor. Your name? Benjamin Singleton, sir. Well, go on. I've taken hundreds of Negroes out of this state and out of seven other states and led them up north. When we first began to leave the plantation, the owners laughed. Yeah, I can hear them now. They said, good riddance. And this is a white man's country anyhow. Go on, they said. Well, we went on. And now when the crops need gathering in and there's hard work to be done, they say there's no organizations up north that's friendly to migrants. They say, stay here. Well, we work things out. Things will be better. After all, 
This Southland is the Negro's home, they say. Well, I... I come back to see if it was any better. But at this convention, I hear the same Southern leaders. But I don't hear of any changes in the status of the oppressed people. Do you offer us any more protection from mob violence? You sharecroppers and migrants out there, listen. They haven't any answer. Then I beg you, forget their pious pledges. They say things will change. When? Has anything changed? Have they stopped at Jim Crow cars? No, still going. Can you vote in the primary elections? No, no. Can you get a square deal in any court? No, no, no. Then until you can, leave this land of wrecked homes, strangled ambitions, make-believe schools and lonely graves. Leave it and follow me to a land where we can make a better life. The convention was over when Singleton led half of the sharecroppers and Negro workers out of Vicksburg and out of the state. The convention was over, and the exodus was on again. And in most states, plantation owners reached out to keep their segregated labor supply from escaping. Local laws and ordinances forbade Negro field workers to move off the plantations without permission from county officials. Still, the exodus went on. 7,000 from Tennessee in three months, 5,000 from Mississippi, 6,000 from Texas. And in Alabama, field hands gathered in the evening and read copies of a northern Negro newspaper that spurred more Negroes to come to Chicago than any single force. And it printed the poems written by the migrants who, through it, spoke to other migrants to come. I watched the trains as they disappeared behind the clouds of smoke, carrying the crowds of working men to the land of hope. Working hard on southern soil, someone softly spoke, toil and toil and toil and toil, and, and yet I'm always broke. On the farms I've labored hard and never missed a day, with wife and children by my side. Through fields we worked our way, but now the year is past and gone, and every penny spent, and all my little food supplies were taken away for rent. Yes, we're going to the north. I don't care to what state. Just so I cross the Mason-Dixon line from this southern land of hate, lynched and burned and shot and hung, when not a word is said, no law whatever to protect. Just a, another poor man did. Once a deputy overheard a man reading a poem like that and broke into the group. All right, here. Here now. Who owns this paper? All right. No one claims it. I'll drag every last one of you into jail. You know that newspaper's not allowed on this plantation. Come on. All of you. In Georgia, the newspapers reported the trial. Five young men were arraigned before Judge E. Swart for reading poetry. The police claimed they were inciting to riot in the city and over Georgia. Two were sent to the Brown Farm for 30 days, a place not fit for human beings. Tom Amaka was arrested for having the poem bound for the promised land, which had been published in The Defender. The judge said he expected this would help the conspiracy to flee to the north. However, the judge pointed out that there were no organizations northwards ready or willing to assist the migrants, and that already racial conflicts above the Mason-Dixon were causing death and destruction. And, in the beginning, the judge was right. Wherever the migrants moved, they were met with riots and conflict. As they poured into the cities seeking jobs, homes, and schools. Race prejudice had migrated ahead of them. 
and hand them in to depreciated neighborhoods and outmoded homes. And when they moved out, the carriers of race prejudice were ready with rumors. Rumors that brought a three-day riot to Springfield, Illinois. August 1910, where two Negro migrants were lynched near the monument of Abraham Lincoln. And rumors and a wild tale brought riots in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Detroit. But still the migrants kept coming on. And once, in a railroad yard in New York, two yards detectives came over to inspect a freight train that had just pulled in from Birmingham. Catch gun out, Max. Something queer about that number eight box up there. Turn's ready. Go on. These Negroes moving up north is what I'm on the lookout for. Coming in on the freight. I'd like to get a hold of it. Yeah. Put the light on, Mac. Uh, what did I tell you? The whole car's full. All right, we've got you covered. Come out of there. Give him a blast in there, Mike, just to let him know we mean business. Oh, uh, gee, might hit someone, Joe. Go on. No need to shoot. We're all coming up. You're all getting out and getting the next freight back to where you came from. We're not going back, mister. Huh? All we want is work and a place to stay. Why, you went to... Just a moment. Huh? What's going on here? Uh, what's it to you? What are you holding these men in the car for? Uh, look, mister, we're put in charge of this railroad line to keep off hobos and tramps. These migrants keep coming into the city, taking jobs away from men who ought to have them. We're sending them back. No. No, I don't think you should send them back. I'd like to talk to them first. Talk to them? Who the devil do you think you are? I'm William Baldwin. So what? Uh, I own this railroad. The owner of the Long Island Railroad lines looked into the freight car and talked to the migrants. And after he had gone home that night, he thought about them for a long time. In the morning, he called his secretary and dictated a memorandum. I've heard about the refugees coming north to escape neg anti-Negro persecution. But I never expected there would be anything I could do to help them. But I've talked with a great many of them, and I was surprised at what I learned. I asked them what they expected to find in northern cities. Was it a promised land? They had no idea about going to a land of plenty, but simply to a land of freedom. If other organizations in this city will join me, I'll agree to form an association which will give assistance and shelter to migrants coming from the South. And thus began the Urban League. Four New York organizations merged together and formed a league of white and Negro leaders of the city and planned ways to integrate the migrants into the life of the new community without conflict, without loss of civil rights. The Urban League has a motto that the migrants like to hear. Not arms, but opportunity. Now, by transcription, Destination Freedom brings you a personal interview with today's executive secretary of the famous Chicago Urban League, Mr. Sidney Williams. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. What is the Chicago Urban League, Mr. Williams? Let me begin by answering what is the Urban League movement and why it came into being. With this bit of background, you will better understand your Chicago Urban League. A bit of history, eh? Yes. The Urban League movement is the concerted effort of white and Negro people of goodwill to achieve two fundamental objectives. These are to bring about better understanding between our white and Negro citizens in the cities and to help us Negro people who now live in these cities effectively and constructively to find our way into the mainstream of the economic, political, and cultural life of our new habitat. The Urban League movement has been at this job ever since 1910 when the movement was started back in New York. Well, now, the Civil War ended in 1865. That's uh, 45 years before the Urban League movement got going. 
Would you please explain the delay? Social scientists differ as to why there was no mass migration of us from the rural South immediately after the Civil War. Personally, I side with those historians who hold that all people, like all people rather, we Negro people respond to the basic urge, where best can we provide for our fundamental need for food, clothing, and shelter? In other words, find jobs. I see. Before 1910 and the years immediately thereafter, the North offered us little in the way of employment, service jobs mainly, and not too many of them. I believe it was deliberate. Why? Because meanwhile, northern industries were expanding. We were rapidly turning from a debtor or agricultural nation into a creditor or manufacturing nation. Our mines and mills needed labor, but they needed also to preserve intact the best market there was for the products of northern industry. That market was the agricultural south, whose economy or way of life was based on cotton, which, in turn, was based on and had to have an abundance of unskilled labor. We Negro people supplied that mass southern need. Northern industry was meeting its labor need by employment of immigrant labor from Europe. Then came World War I. Emigration dropped and finally was cut off completely. Meanwhile, the demands on our mills and transport systems became the greatest ever. Workers were needed. Where were they to be found? In the cotton fields of the South, black workers. Jobs hitherto close to us were wide open. The first migration was on. Well, now tell us more about how and why the Urban League movement was started. The movement started with the first noticeable migration to the North. There was already a framework of social services, but for historical reasons, their operators were intellectually and emotionally unprepared and unwilling to make these services available to us. Well, now, what, what made for this intellectual block? Primarily, it stemmed from the welt of propaganda laid down against us by the spokesman for the slave system. Mm. They had a vested interest. They not only determined every facet of Southern life, but forced their views into the textbooks and classrooms of northern, secondary, collegiate, professional, and graduate schools. That's a bad situation. What about the emotional unpreparedness of the social workers toward Negro migrants? Well, in the light of the intellectual history I've just cited, you can imagine the emotional and psychological patterns of behavior social agencies of that era showed toward us. They simply did not care to have us around. We disturbed their souls, their professional sensibilities. For, despite the propaganda, most of the staffs of these agencies knew that we were normal human beings in every respect. These social workers saw little, if any, difference between us and the immigrant peasants. They, these European immigrants, and we, Negro migrants, were simply people possessing no knowledge of city life. Yes, I can see what you're talking about. Those social agencies were, were in a quandary. You bet they were, but I'd prefer to call it a dilemma. Mm -hmm. The Urban League and many other forces have helped American social work to get off the horns of this dilemma and on the right side. Today, most social agencies now quite readily serve Negro clients. Well, do you mean to infer that the Urban League takes care of all the welfare needs of the Negro community? By no means. We prevail on the other agencies to make their services available to Negro persons. It's a sort of planning and checking job that we do with them. Well, Mr. Williams, is Chicago now perfectly or, or reasonably democratic in the matter of making all its social services available to the Negro community? Well, Mr. Mountain, you'll have to distinguish between the public and private social agencies. All right. First, about the public financed agencies. Most of them are all right. And the private services? Well, except for the hospitals and homes for boys and girls, I have not heard many complaints. With regard to race relations, most of our Chicago private hospitals are extremely backward. In conjunction with our Chicago Metropolitan Welfare Council, Community Fund, Commission on Human Relations, and many, many other organizations, the Urban League is trying to bring them around. We are encouraged by the going practice in our Jewish hospitals. They are right on this question. So are a few other private hospitals. Well, now, I'm, I'm sure the League does more than just plan and check, doesn't it? Yes, we do. 
We have a small industrial department consisting of seven workers whose main job is to help Negro workers to stabilize or safeguard the gains they made during the war. That is the job gains. Mm -hmm. To help new, open up new job opportunities for Negro workers. To help Negro workers through, their, through labor and management to work most effectively with their fellow white employees. And to help sell, sell employers and the total community on the need for and wisdom of the adoption and execution of the principles of fair employment practices. Would you be just a bit more specific about the work of the League's industrial department? Happily. It interviews uh, applicants with skills and seeks to find them jobs in keeping with their abilities. Since our staff is small and our facilities limited, and since beyond this we are all taxed to maintain a public employment service, the League does not do mass and routine placements. However, we do work closely with the State Employment Service to see that Negro workers get a fair shake. Most of this department's time, however, and energies are consumed in working on new employers, like our Loop Department stores, in an effort to persuade them to hire Negro workers, and in the case of the few who have made this fundamental step, toward redemption, to have them upgrade their Negro employees solely in accordance with their abilities. Isn't it a pity that what other Americans expect and get as a matter of right, we Negro workers have to beg and fight for? It is indeed, Mr. Williams. Look, I I've heard about the League's Community Organization Department. What's its function? Well, you remember the old biblical saying about man not living by bread alone, haven't you? Yes, I have. Well, in our attempt to help Negro workers become urbanized, our responsibility to them does not cease with finding jobs for them. They must have houses to live in. That's a major problem, as you know. Oh, yes. The stimulated resistance of certain communities to our moving in is presenting Chicago today with its most serious cause of tension between white and Negro citizens. But back to the routine functions of this department. It works with the residents to help improve their living conditions. Well, what other major departmental activity do you have at the League? There's our public education department. Its function is to interpret the Negro community to itself and to the general community, to interpret the general community to the Negro community, and to interpret the functions of the League in this two-way process. Well, what's your total staff? Eight, Eighteen, including the caretaker. Oh. Ten professional and seven clerical workers. That certainly is not too many when one considers the fact that Chicago's Negro population is about one half million. You bet. To do this job that's needed to be done in a genuinely acceptable manner will require a staff five times our present one. And, of course, a budget six times our present 1950 budget. Well, what is your 1950 budget? Roughly $90,000. Who supervises the expending of this budget? A board of directors composed of 25 white and Negro members of goodwill. And final review rests with the community fund, which underwrites one half of our operating budget. I see. Well, where does the rest of your budget come from, Mr. Williams? The League rounds out its budget through the generous individual contributions of its many friends, Negro and white, Protestant and Roman Catholic, Jewish and Gentile, business and labor, but most of all, from a host of ordinary people of goodwill. The Urban League both invites and welcomes you into its big family of members. For further information, drop a card to the Chicago Urban League, 3032 South Wabash, Chicago 16, or to station WMAQ. Thank you, Mr. Williams. You have just heard Destination Freedom story of the Urban League and a transcribed interview with Mr. Sidney Williams, Executive Secretary of the Urban League of Chicago. Destination Freedom is written by Richard Durham and produced under the direction of Homer Heck. The narrator was Dean Almquist. Others were Oscar Brown, Jr., Maurice Copeland, Jack Lester, Fred Pinkard, Jess Pugh, and Russ Reed. The special music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and played by Elwyn Owen and Jose Bethencourt. Sound effects were by Cliff Mueller, and your engineer was Gary DeVlieg. This is Charles Mountain inviting you to be with us again next week when Destination Freedom will tell the story of William Henry Huff, famed extradition attorney.
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.